Hey everyone, welcome to the first ever episode of the Divorcing Religion podcast. I am so excited. I can't believe this day is finally here. And I especially cannot believe my amazing first guest. If you are watching the Divorcing Religion podcast, you probably already know all about Seth Andrews. Seth is a former evangelical Christian broadcaster who now hosts The Thinking Atheist, one of the most popular online atheist communities in the world. Since its launch in 2010, the Thinking Atheist podcast has been downloaded over 50 million times. I mean, that takes my breath away. That's an awful lot. Seth is also busy when he's not busy behind the microphone. Uh, he's authored five books, including his latest, Christianity Made Me Talk Like an Idiot. Welcome, Seth. It's nice to see you. Good to be here and good to see my good friend Janice again. Thanks for letting me play along. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for joining me. And, mm -hmm. and we recently um, connected because we both were speaking at Terry Daniels uh, conference. And then I saw uh, you had uh, released an interesting talk about that, about some of the things that went on there, because someone who had attended uh, just took some issue with um, your topic <laughs> about Christianity as a yeah. blood cult. And I watched that video last night with my husband and it was fantastic. You are just right on the money. You hit every every point for people, particularly who've left um, Christianity. And it really does seem to be kind of a blood cult. Hey, you don't think about it much when you're in it. But, you know, when you when you sing, are you washed in the blood? And then you step back and realize I'm asking to be washed in blood. It does seem weird. And, and there was there were uh, two people who hated the speech. One walkout. Mm -hmm. She was an Episcopal priest, and uh, but she and I opened a dialogue the next day. Yes. So rather than just throw stones at each other from afar, <laughs> we decided to be human beings about it. And mm -hmm. we ended up sitting at the same table and we exchanged ideas. I don't know that we came to total agreement on things, but I mean, it was it was good. It was, uh, you know, it was a de-escalation. It was a connection as, as people. And uh, that's kind of been my thing lately. I've been talking a lot about, you know, I'm I'm... I understand sometimes we have to be polarized against our ideological opponents, but I think it's happening far too often than it's supposed to. And um, I'm trying to reconnect with my own humanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's kind of been my thing recently. But uh, thanks for the kind words on the speech. It's out on YouTube. Just uh, Google Seth Andrews blood cult. It'll mm -hmm. pop right up. Mm -hmm. And that's such uh, an interesting Oh, idea and something that I wish everybody would be working towards because we do see so much polarization and division today, um, not just around religion, but certainly we see it politically too. And it can feel like the gulf is impassable. How, how can we actually sit and have a conversation with people who think so differently uh, than we do. And so I really love that you were willing to um, reach out and sit with that uh, person. And and it just really seemed to smooth some things over, even though, as you say, you didn't come away from it, both of you in total agreement with the other. But she saw that you're a very approachable person and a decent, compassionate person, even though your views are different uh, than hers. So I think that goes an awful long way. Yeah, yeah. I was glad to see it happen. So. Me too. Uh, I'm wondering if you would tell us a little bit about your own religious background and why you left. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, so many people have heard my story, so I'll make it short for sure. the few who have mm -hmm. not. I was raised by theologian parents. They met at Oral Roberts University. They honeymooned in the Holy Lands. My mother taught and still teaches New Testament Greek. So, I mean, there was no religious small talk. It was all, you know, literal Bible, private Christian school, Christian music, Christian stuff, Christian friends, Christian activities, you know. And uh, I grew out of that sort of uh, little fundamentalist pod into a career in Christian radio. I was a Christian radio host for about 12 years and segued from that into uh, pop radio, rock and roll radio. And then I became a video producer. Mostly we served churches. And, you know, over the course of really a long time, 
I was growing more and more dissatisfied. I, you know, I, I, you know, back in the, the nineties, even I, now that I look back, I think the doubts were there starting to crawl to the surface, but you know, I, there were so many reasons not to listen. I was afraid. I didn't trust my own mind, you know, trust not in your own understanding. <laughs> yep. Um, I was afraid of hell. Mm-hmm. I was afraid of losing everybody I, I cared about. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe it has something to do with midlife. As you get older, you become less and less and less interested in keeping other people happy. Like mm-hmm. you become less and less worried as you, uh, uh, what other people think. I think sometimes as you get older, you know, hey, wait a minute, I'm on the clock here. <laughs> and um, I finally gave myself permission to take uh, kind of my own journey. And I had a couple of, you know, catalysts that kicked me into high gear. There was a debate video and I read some books and I don't know, it's blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the journey, I mean, all the dominoes just fell over and then fell off the table. And mm-hmm. and I just, I just, I, I couldn't do it. I didn't wow. choose to be an atheist. I simply realized that I no longer believed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think my journey, my hardcore journey started in 2007, but it wasn't until 2008 that I actually said the word atheist out loud in regard mm-hmm. to myself. Mm-hmm. That was scary. You know, I am an atheist. Is a, Some people think it's melodramatic to say it's a big deal, but it was a big deal. It was, uh, it was scary. I can but absolutely I, you know, I, relate. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't not continue the journey. I, I couldn't mm-hmm. shut it off. Once I had been unplugged from the matrix, I looked around and I'm like, I, I can't not pursue this. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I escaped. I'm a slow learner, but I can be taught. And uh, mm-hmm. finally, I came out of fundamentalism into mm-hmm. um, what I consider to be a much better and broader world. You know, a world where every day can be a discovery, where I don't have to start with an answer mm-hmm. and then ask the questions. Right. I've met so many lovely people out there who uh, who never once fit into that cookie cutter that mm-hmm. I was uh, forcing everybody into. So many reasons I'm glad I'm out. But I am out and I've been an activist uh, full time. Uh, Well, I say I've I've been an activist full time really since 2009, but I have been officially full time for the last seven years and still kick it. Wow. What's been the hardest um, about leaving? So you mentioned some of the fears that you had when you first were even considering exploring outside of um, Christianity. Um, What what was the hardest once you actually got going? Was it I mean, relationships with your parents, your mom obviously is still a. A believer? Yeah. yeah. Probably at first, uh, there were probably three major tiers. I was a a believer in a literal hell. Depart Mm -hmm. from me, all you who are cursed into a lake of everlasting fire and damnation. Mm -hmm. My father used to tell me, you know, hell is a real place. You don't want to, you don't want to rebel against God because he's loving, but he is also just, which is, you know, a threat, right? Mm -hmm. Love me or I'll burn you was essentially God's message that I was supposed to embrace and, and be so, so thankful for. But Mm -hmm. logically, I knew it made no sense. I, I knew it made no moral sense. I knew that the Bible was bunk. I knew all these things, but emotionally. I had been so branded for so long, so trained to be afraid of torture that it took me a long time, a lot of sleepless nights where I had to wrestle my way through it. You know, you can't trust your your gut on this one, your heart on this one. This, this Seth, you're going to have to power through and and use reason as a guide. And, and also... I began to get into the history of hell theology and the Mm -hmm. different types of hell theology and Mm -hmm. how it's been weaponized to control people and keep followers from asking too many questions. Mm -hmm. And and then I began to interact more with people who had also escaped 
uh, from this sort of fear of eternal torment and damnation. That was a long process for me to emotionally be free of that took years. Mm -hmm. Um, My employer was a devout evangelical. Most of our clients, video clients were Christian churches. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, that was the second tier. I was terrified. Like, what do I do as I approach 40? If I lose my job, what else? What when I what am I going to do? What how what do I well I lose my house? How will I pay the bills? Uh, so it's when you know your livelihood comes into play. That's another layer to the onion. Yes, uh, it's not just um, well someone might be uncomfortable or you might have an argument, but someone might find an excuse to get rid of you. I mean, mm-hmm. legally they can't do it because you're an atheist. But that's not how discrimination usually works. Usually discrimination happens between the letters of the law, between the lines. Well, Seth has poor communication skills. We had to let him go. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. I was worried about that. (laughs) Mm. And uh, the third thing was, I I wasn't shunned by my family, but you can imagine theologian parents, fundamentalist parents who did everything. They were so intent on making us Christian that my mother went to work full-time just to pay the tuition for private schools to make sure we weren't exposed to things like evolution, et cetera. You know, it it was the kind of commitment that's really pretty impressive when you look at how they they were going to train up a child in the way that he should Uh go Mm -hmm. so that when he is older, he would not do what I did, which was depart from it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And I mean, it was was shattering to them. It was Mm -hmm. their worst freaking nightmare. Yes. And it was, uh, you know, we failed as parents. If only we'd shown you the love of Jesus. And there's tears and there's, you know, shouting and there's arguments. And, and you know, I've, I'm have i an embarrassment. I'm embarrassing the family. Seth, why mm-hmm. can't you just be quiet about all these doubts? Why do you have to be so rebellious? And, you know, I'm, it, it was so contentious that it really, in many meaningful ways, cost us our relationship. Mm-hmm. Um even when I'm in their presence, my father passed away last year, but mm. it, being in their presence, being with them under the small talk, you can feel the undercurrent. Mm-hmm. How's the weather? How's retirement? How's the cat? You know, mm-hmm. um, we talk about the surface stuff, but you can feel underneath there's this river of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm also very aware, forgive the long answer, Janice. Oh, please keep going. (laughs) Um, When you're in an overwhelmingly religious family, everybody, it's time to pray and bless the meal. So we all do that. And I stand respectfully until it's over. And you look up and there's Jesus paintings on the wall and there's a last supper and there's a cross necklace and somebody's talking about their their missions program or they're a deacon at the church. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's so religious that even when you're not talking overtly about it, you feel an outsideness. Mm -hmm. I I feel like I I am, I am the other. And it's really hard to not be in a place where the people around you who are supposedly your tribe share your values and you know it. Mm-hmm. And you know by knowing then that when you leave the room, they are likely talking about you. Mm-hmm. They're talking in a derogatory way with that sort of nauseatingly condescending <laughs> pity party. We hope one day that he comes to meet the love of Jesus yes. again, kind of thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um and uh it's you feel lonely. I mean, you just get I you know, I I I really struggled, but like I told Natalie, I I, I don't have I, I'm related to people I don't relate to. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we, you know, we'll get together a few times a year and it's all pleasant and mm-hmm. hey, it's good to see you. But I, I don't I, I don't feel a sense of connection. Right. Meanwhile, you know, I, I just got back from a series of speaking events. Yes. Out, uh, you were in Canada. Work. I was in Canada. Oh, yeah. Just did uh, three cities in Texas. It was in Nashville, did Orlando, Atlanta, going to Minneapolis. I mean, it's just been really good. But that's my opportunity to be at a meeting of my people, to be in a room of people who we share values. And Mm -hmm. and it's funny because you really learn that family comes in many forms. There's this Mm -hmm. antiquated thinking that that blood is thicker than water Mm -hmm. and that biological family is always family and you Mm -hmm. have to defer and you have to feel that connection and all these things that they told you, but that's not 
That's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, family needs to act like family. Mm-hmm. And if they simply do not, then you must uh, go out and form a new family. It's the family you choose, a family mm-hmm. that acts like family. Mm-hmm. They may not be related by blood directly, but they they are your people. They have yeah. your back. They will challenge you and love you and support you and be there for you. And so, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it was, you know, it's messy, but I think a lot of people's journeys are messy. And now mm-hmm. I've sort of committed a lot of what I do to try to encourage other people that I don't care, you know, call yourself an atheist if you're not an atheist, whatever you are, but you owe yourself permission to take your own journey. Oh, yeah. And anybody, any family who threatens to shun or ostracize Mm -hmm. or emotionally blackmail you, they're not acting like family. And Mm -hmm. the problem is not yours. The problem is theirs. And I really tried to just encourage people that life's too short to sit around trying to keep everybody else comfortable and unchallenged. That's not, you don't owe them that. If they're uncomfortable, that says more about them than it says about you. Wow. Yes. I'm glad we're recording this. I'll just play it back for my clients. Because <laughs> I, get, I, I work uh, with folks who are recovering from religious trauma and many of them come to me wondering how do they approach their loved ones? How do they come out essentially to their spouse who's still a believer or their parents is a, a really common one. And of course they fear the dynamic of the relationship changing and it absolutely will change and there's not too much that we can do to prevent it from from changing but there comes a point where our need for authenticity outweighs our need for acceptance and that's typically the time when we realize okay i can i have to be able to be myself so then i go over with them some steps they can take to try and help prepare, you know, make things a little bit uh, easier or less bumpy, but there's still no guarantee how things will go. But that that sits so heavily on people. And it's true. Our relationship does tend then to uh, become more shallow. We have to work at things, try and develop things that we can do together uh, that aren't religiously um, affiliated. Uh, it's there's no there's no easy way around it when you're the one that finally wakes up to reality and decides to embrace reality and divorce religion but everyone else is still kind of playing pretend in a way even though they believe it sincerely that makes for a hard um it's difficult for communication to go on on a really deep level when that's the There's case. There's a lot there too. I think it's a little different with mothers and fathers. It's funny. I, I did a speech years ago where I was talking about how parents would tell their children, you can grow up to be anything that you want to be in this world. And they tell children that. Yeah. And then they commit their resources to limiting your options. Mm-hmm. You can be, don't be that. No, you don't worship <laughs> like that. Oh my God. Don't marry that. Don't do this. You know? This is not how we raised you. This is a common thing that, mm-hmm. that you hear. And, and I think that's, uh, that betrays how a lot of parents see. They, they want the child to not grow up to be independent, but to be kind of an echo of themselves. Yes. I, I, this is how I continue on. Uh, mm-hmm. And if the child is too different, then they feel that they have somehow failed. And, mm-hmm. and they, in that case, are not raising individuals, which is tragic. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times there's a double standard where they expect, you know, the religious parents expect the children to, you know, uh, we're supposed to sit on our hands and not make waves. And we don't talk about your atheism. Don't, Mm -hmm. I mean, meanwhile, they get to be as religious as they want. Uh They would be aghast if we said, can you just be, keep quiet about Jesus because it makes me uncomfortable. They would just be horrified. I'll never be quiet about my Jesus. This is part of my, who I am. But if I go in and I speak to my values as whatever. They're just aghast and they demand that I pipe down to keep the peace. Well, that's not peace. What that is, is an absence of conflict. And there's a difference. And the reason there's an absence of conflict is because I'm the one who doesn't get to be his authentic self. Mm -hmm. And that's just not, it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. With the Mm -hmm. spouse thing, I was doing a speech in Arkansas, must have been five years ago. And there was a guy who was going through a tremendously difficult time with his spouse. They were both devout believers, kids and play, right? They have children and he deconstructs Mm -hmm. and 
And he realizes, I mean, after they're married, the contract is signed, their lives mm -hmm. are shared. And all of a sudden he's not a Christian anymore. Mm -hmm. And she panics. Who, what happened? What is this? What's happened to my husband? This is not the deal I made. You know, she's just freaking out. She's mm -hmm. terrified. And his whole life was on the bubble. And I actually produced um, a short form video called Letter to a Christian Spouse, where I spoke in the abstract, but I spoke really to her. And I'm like, take a look at your husband. Mm -hmm. He didn't choose this. He didn't wake up and say, today, I would like to undo the fabric of my entire life. Nice. Today, I would like to discard all the things that I once held dear mm -hmm. and uproot everything and throw my life into turmoil yeah. and have all of this angst and upset my family. I, he didn't choose any of that. Mm -hmm. And so it, look at him and, and understand that this is a man who is simply trying to take a journey honestly, despite the difficulties mm -hmm. and see the merit in that. And then I also encouraged her to to look in his eyes and listen to his voice and look at his disposition and see his values and ask yourself, is this not the same man mm -hmm. that I married mm -hmm. in the first place? We simply may disagree theologically, but he's at his core, still a lovable, lovely person who I want to share my life with. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, you know, I, I, um, I don't know how that came out. Uh, they may be together. They may have reconciled. They may have divorced. I don't know the end of that story. But it's a message I would give to a lot of people who feel like, you know, my my apostate spouse pulled the rug out from underneath me. I understand that sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I try to just calm them and say they didn't choose this. They just want to live authentically, which I think speaks to a real integrity. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. start there and then yes. we'll figure the theology out afterwards. Yes. So there's a, a lot going on there, a lot of gears yeah. in that machine. Yeah, there's uh, there's real wisdom in approaching it that way. And and when I'm working with folks who uh, one spouse has left religion, the other is still in there. I tell them we need to shift our focus off of shared beliefs onto shared values yeah. because we still do have uh, the same a lot of the same core values. And even for people who just have left religion on their own and are now working to build a healthy secular identity and secular life, it helps them to do some values clarification work. So they can actually figure out, well, what's important to me now, uh, as opposed to what my parents told me had to be important to me, trying to figure out who, what's really at the core of you. What do you like and dislike? Do you know why you like or dislike it? And I have people coming to me in, my, in their 40s and 50s who have a hard time answering those questions because they their personality wasn't allowed to develop apart from their parents' religious beliefs and pressures. And, and you kind of touched on it right at the start, uh, the idea that we don't want to waste the limited time we have living someone else's version of who we should be, someone else's yeah. view of how our life should go. We're allowed to grow, outgrow our parents to expand beyond what they hoped for us. Because if they're if they're very religious, then their hope for us was pretty narrow. I hope you're enjoying this inaugural episode of the Divorcing Religion podcast with special guest Seth Andrews. Wow. I also wanted to remind you to check out the links in the show notes so that you can get your ticket to the upcoming conference, Shameless Sexuality, Life After Purity Culture. And also to let you know, you can support me in my work by becoming a patron on Patreon. Links are in the show notes. And now back to Seth. I just spoke at the um, Blue Water Atheist Humanist Convention in Sarn Sarnia, Ontario. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Greta Bosper was there. She's a she's an atheist who is also a minister, which many people would see as an oxymoron. Wow. But if you know, if you know Greta, you know that she is essentially a, a kind of humanist chaplain. Right. She uh, her messages are really about um, about our values as humanists. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, talked about shared values, she was talking about how their church. This was years back. Put together a a statement of, I don't know what they called it, core beliefs, or I can't remember exactly. But instead of going through and saying, well, this is our doctrine, they formulated as these are our values. Mm -hmm. And it was the kind of document that could be held by a religious or a non 
religious person, but it was about protecting people's rights and you know the bodily autonomy of women and and loving people where they are and um, seeing us all as part of the human condition and being kind and charitable and trying to build a better world and, and all these things. And in that way, if you look at us in terms of values, and this is one of the bridges I've been trying to help build out there, as you stop or if, if on fewer occasions, you look at someone and you say, well, they're religious, I'm atheist, therefore we can't be in the same you know, on the same page, under the same label, on the same team. Mm -hmm. But that's not remotely true. Uh, I have a lot of people in this world that I share values with who are devout believers, who are lovely people. And they don't deserve to be put in a box or a cookie cutter. They're not awful, terrible, stupid, whatever people. They're lovely people. I, I would take these Christians over some atheists in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think we are in this weird hyper-polarized age where we want to put everybody in a, you know, in this little bubble and we want to describe them with a word or a term or a meme or a hashtag. But people are complicated. Mm -hmm. I've met beautiful religious people. I've met ugly atheists. You know, mm -hmm. I've met wonderful atheists and I've met horrible religious people. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, I, you know, let's start with people. Let's start yeah. there. Yeah, And then let's look at uh, your values and your goals and your attitudes and so where you've come. I mean, I, when I was speaking in Ontario, I was talking about someone that in this polarized world would have been vilified on Twitter. You know, he's a manga evangelical type, you know, Fox News Christian. He was anti-LGBT rights. He was, mm -hmm. he was uh, you know, bigoted against Muslims, thought they were all terrorists and you know, he was against the right to die issues, and thought that the uh, scientists were all trying to kill God and, oh, dear. and didn't know atheists and didn't trust, uh, you know, would thought all the atheists were going to hell. And then I reveal, well, that person was me. <laughs> huh? It just you know, my, that person was me. <laughs> I love it. And um, <clears throat> I wasn't a bad person. I was a good man trying to do the right thing. But I had been indoctrinated with bad ideas. Yes, exactly. And I just needed a chance and um, I needed patience and I needed some empathy and understanding. Uh, I needed some humanity to help me on my journey out. It was a long journey. And this idea that, you know, if I'd logged on to Twitter this morning and announced any of the things I just said to you because they were a part of my conviction, that I may have been destroyed. They may have just come down on me like a hammer and mm -hmm. called me every name in the book and mm -hmm. And I just don't think that's how we change the world, you know, I, and that's why I appreciate the work that you do, Janice. I think that there's a real empathy and perspective and compassion in regard to believers that we desperately need if we're going to change the world and help to disabuse people of bad ideas. I think, mm -hmm. you know, we start with humanity and mm -hmm. if we don't have our humanity, I mean, you know, that's no way to live. It's so true. And to that end, I find Encouraging people to swap out judgment for curiosity goes a very, very long way. So those of us who grew up in fundamentalist religious homes, um, curiosity was stamped out of us pretty early and replaced with obedience. We had to obey the first time every time. And that's just how it was. And instead of uh, prizing curiosity because it could lead to new discoveries, what was prized was uh obedience. And so judgment also comes in with that. Well, some things are good that you do, and then some things are very, very bad. And then we grow up, become adults. And even though we leave religion, we can still take a lot of that propensity towards uh, judgment with us. And so I encourage people wherever possible, when you notice judgment rising up in you, uh, Take a break and start asking some questions. Get curious about it. Get curious about life and about other people and what makes them tick. And then you can maybe start to have a dialogue, asking people with warmth and curiosity rather than hard judgment uh, about what they do believe and why they believe it and how were they influenced in their background that helped to mold the views that they have. You use the word indoctrination. Very powerful, very powerful, especially when we're children and we're indoctrinated and we have no defense against it. So, of course, we're going to believe uh, what we're told by authorities and parents. 
Yeah, there's so many reinforcers, aren't there? You know, the same parents who, you know, kept you safe and fed your mouth and, mm -hmm. and you know, taught you not to talk to strangers and, and, you know, all these other life skills. It's the same one that told you that Jesus was watching from the sky and that heaven and hell awaited the dead and that Adam and Eve once lived in the garden. And you look up at them and you say, oh, yes, you know, they, they of course, they're telling the truth. I think you, uh, you're you raised with, especially in funded cultures, the mm -hmm. sort of deference to authority with a capital A. Mm -hmm. Well, God is the authority who put my family in authority over me, and therefore I'm supposed to just obey. It is an obedience culture. And I mm -hmm. I think if you're a child, obedience certainly is a, it's a part of it. You know, it helps keep you safe as, as a, mm -hmm. a dependent and a minor and, and a vulnerable uh, young person. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, I fantasize sometimes, what if they just said... What if they answered my question with a question? Well, what do you think? Yeah. Have you done any homework? Have you done any reading about this? Well, let's do it here. I'll tell you what, let's, why don't we do some research and you tell me what you found and I'll tell you what I found. And if you mm -hmm. learned something new, I want to know about it. And to make every day a discovery whenever I uh, autograph stuff, especially for young people, I like to use that line. Make every day a discovery. Wonderful. Because when you... You know, when you don't have all the answers and when you haven't shut off all of your, your questions and because you've already got it all figured out and when you're not putting everything in a tiny box, every day can be a discovery. Every day you wake up and you're like, well, what, what new thing will I learn today? What, what fresh excitement is there to life that I will discover today? And that's a beautiful place to be. Now, there's this thinking sometimes that, well, if, if you live in a universe that doesn't care if you exist and your life is only finite that why bother? And I see uh, the exact opposite. Uh, if the universe doesn't care if I exist, who cares? I mean, I care. The universe hasn't given me purpose. A God hasn't given me purpose. Wonderful. I get to self-generate purpose. I get to follow my values and goals and dreams. Mm -hmm. And because I'm on the clock and I see no evidence for another life after this life, well, that adds a real urgency now. I mean, now I know that carpe diem, don't waste the day. You, you, you're on the clock, pal. Mm -hmm. So... Find what you love and, and be with your people and, and discover and hold to your values and set the goals and achieve them and then set new ones and, and, you know, make the memories and just connect with your existence as much as you can for the time that you have, because there may be no tomorrow. I've actually been much more fulfilled post-religion. I've had more awe and wonder in my life post religion. I've had more love, goodness. I'm more charitable. I'm more giving. I'm just more balanced and happy post-religion than I ever was in the Christian faith. And that's mm -hmm. part of the drama I pound for everybody else because they're like, well, how can you have any joy or goodness? And I'm like, you have no idea. Uh, Gail <laughs> Jordan with Recovering from Religion says oh, yeah. it so well. She said, there's so much more light, air, and space on this side. Yes. And that's how I phrase it. There's so much more light, air, and space. Just come over here and breathe the free air. Yes. You will love it. Yes. And uh, that's why I rarely, if ever, see anybody ever go back into religion once they've escaped. Mm -hmm. Because now they're like, wow, you know, now I get to now I get to be me on my terms for my reasons without mm -hmm. apology. And good yes. for them. Yes. I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes said, um, the mind once expanded cannot return to its original dimension. And I think that's so true. That's been absolutely true for me with regard to religion. Um, I, when I busted out of that religious corset, uh, it, it just, my life expanded so much. And that sounds like uh, what you and, and Gail were um, talking about. It's, I tell people that life is a buffet table. And as far as you can see, there are dishes laid out. Fundamentalism would have us starve to death at that buffet table. And we don't have to. We are welcome to take a bite of every dish. If we don't like it, we can spit it out and we don't have to have more. If we do like it, we can go back for seconds and thirds. We're just allowed to be curious and try all these different things. If it's not breaking a law and it's not harming another person, we are allowed to try it. And yet I remember feeling so terrified when my my faith, my worldview was just dissolving around me. And I had been such a devout believer for about 40 years. And I was terrified that I couldn't seem to 
put my faith back together again. It was just gone. Uh, and I knew that I would have to start exploring and seeing if maybe there was something else that was true. And I was so terrified to do it. The thought of it's like if, if there's a fence around a schoolyard, the little kids might kind of cluster around the fence, but you take the fence away and they right away go together in the middle of the schoolyard as a group. They're too scared to go venture um, near the edge. And that's kind of how I felt. It was a really scary time, but it was also terribly exciting because the transition, you know, we're on the threshold of change, something, something terrible and something wonderful might be out there waiting for us. We just have to be willing to step through and see what it is. So interesting yeah. to see, you know, those people who say, I'll never change or you'll mm -hmm. never change my mind. And they're mm -hmm. yeah, on the surface level, they feel a sense of safety. You know, if, if things don't change, then, you know, everything's steady. But, but, you know, the one constant in this world is change. Mm -hmm. If you're not, I don't think you're ever holding still. I think you're either progressing or regressing. I don't think you ever just stay. And if you were to snapshot me 20 years ago and mm -hmm. snapshot me this morning, you'll change. I mean, you would see such a tremendous change. But I... Some people think that's something to be threatened by or, you know, to see they see change as weakness. Well, if you change, it's almost like science when science makes an update or evolves in some way. The, the fact that science changes to some people is a weakness. Well, it had to alter itself. And I'm like, that's the point. Yes. You know, when you know better, you do better. You're always sharpening your knives. You're not dogmatic about things. You are your radar is up so that mm -hmm. you can, you know, better hone in directionally on what is accurate and what is mm -hmm. not. And, mm -hmm. and I love the idea that people will open themselves up to, I mean, if I use the word evolution, I know it's kind of a, it, there's a lot of baggage there, but to evolve, to, yeah. you know, to be able to be a sponge and the more, you know, and the more people you meet and the more places you see and, and the more uh, life experience and maturity and all these things that happen, and you get the opportunity to change. And the hope is, is that you are, you're better tomorrow than you were yesterday, and you'd be better next month than you were tomorrow. And I think changes should be a goal. I mean, the, the idea of embracing change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be the old Seth. I could, I mean, I'm, I kind of miss having a metabolism. <laughs> I kind of miss being able to eat pizza at every meal and you know sleep till noon. Yeah. But um, but overall, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want that guy back. I I like what where I'm at, and I'm hoping maybe I'll get the chance to evolve a little more in the years ahead. Change it's it can be a beautiful thing. Yes, yes, that is so true. Uh, even if I think back. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there's no way I could have imagined what my life would be like today. I would never have imagined that um, I would have lost my faith or rejected my faith or divorced religion. I couldn't have imagined that I would have divorced my husband, who was a pastor, um, that I would now be working with people from around the world who uh, are building their new secular lives. That's just, that would have been horrifying to me. And yet here I am feeling more fulfilled than I ever have. And like you say, more joyful. I don't have restrictions on whom I can love. I can love anybody. It's not just uh, only people that the Bible says I can love. And that there's really something beautiful about that liberty and that freedom. Amazing how our paths cross, right? I mean, on our own separate journeys in different parts of the world. And had we not taken those journeys, we would never have become friends yeah. and had the opportunity to even speak now. And I think about all the time I spent in my religious youth, just sitting around putting people in little boxes and judging them. Mm -hmm. And I think about how many of those people that I once judged who now that I don't have those religious shackles, I'm not having to look look at them through my God glasses. I can see the beauty of who they are, all the diversity and differences in the human condition. And I can just open my life right up to them and then we're all better for it. And that's a real joy for me. You know, I, 
I think I think of all the people I know who are beautiful people who are atheists or agnostics or non-Christians, be it Muslim or or Sikhs or Jainists or whatever, you know. Uh, I I I no longer have to cram them into this sort of byline. I can I can see them as a human being and I can incorporate their lives into mine in a meaningful way. And it just it would never have happened had I not given myself permission mm -hmm. to say I'm no longer constrained by the dogmas that were branded onto me when right. I was a young, impressionable person. I'm, I'm no longer, no one else gets to tell me who my friends are. No That's one tells right. me who my family is. No one tells me what my identity is, my values. And uh, man, I, it opened up my whole world. I, I have family now not biological, but I mean, in terms of family support and friendship yeah. and and uh, all these beautiful things that family should be. I have family all over the world. <laughs> and what an honor. Yeah. What an amazing thing. I would love for the people I know who live these tiny, little, terrified, indoctrinated, rigid sort of lives. I'd like them to experience just a fraction of the goodness that mm -hmm. I experience by having this wild, wide, diverse humanity yeah. as part of my my existence. I don't know. It sounds like a Hallmark movie, Janice, when I say it out loud, but it really is. It's just it, it, so much more is possible mm -hmm. when you're not walking a path that somebody else carved out for you. Oh, yeah, right? that's so true. I wonder if you ever hear from people that you used to know in your church days and they have now left religion. Do you yeah. ever hear from them? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, there have been... A few people in the Christian radio business. Uh, in fact, there's two, I think, that may still work in Christian radio because that's kind of how they pay the bills. Yeah. And secretly, they've sort of, they said, I work in the business, but I'm, I'm an atheist, but, you know. Wow. And, I, you know, I don't know if they're trying to navigate their way out. And yeah. I understand that. It's almost like being a preacher where that's, you know, this is your livelihood. It's yes. not It's not as simple as saying, I'm going to cast it off and walk away. You've mm -hmm. got a family to feed. You've got yeah. children. You've got responsibilities. It is sometimes a game of chess over checkers. It's a long game. Oh, yeah. You almost want to be able out. to direct them to the clergy project or something yeah. else where because it's their livelihood. And well, so you know, they binary still reach thinkers. out. We'll yeah. say like, you know, you're a coward if you don't go scream it from the mountaintop oh, right off the bat. What's wrong with you? And I'm not that guy. It mm -hmm. took me, I did the Thinking Atheist um, videos website for two years, the podcast for one, and people knew only my first name and they had not seen my face mm -hmm. because I was terrified that my religious employer would see what I was doing and find a reason to fire me. And mm -hmm. I would then not be able to pay my mortgage. I would lose my house. I would not be able to pay my bills. I would have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And it was years, it was years getting to a point where I could finally do it. And so I have all this empathy for people who are just in negotiating, trying to figure it out. But I've had people in the Christian music business, radio, I've had people who are backup musicians for Christian artists touring the, yeah. the world. And they're like, I play drums or bass in this Christian band, but psst, I'm an atheist. I, you know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm clocking in. I am doing what I got to do as a contract musician. You know, I've had... Um, former co-workers in the video business, people I used to sit right next to. And um, wow. they reached out and they're like, hey, I just want to let you know, you know, I'm <laughs> kind of on your page, pal. And I've also uh, bumped into a few people I went to high school with. Oh, yeah. You know, I graduated high school in 1986, religious, private, Christian school, and our paths crossed decades and decades later. And they said, you know, I was devout, and then I started to become more and more dissatisfied and I left. And it's funny because here it is, you know, 40 years later and I bumped into you. And, um, and it's <laughs> weird. It's like a small world kind of moment where we then have this connection like, wow, we walked some of the same steps. We kind of went full circle and we met each other at the end. So mm -hmm. long answer to a short question is yes, I do get a lot of correspondence from people. Oh, you say that they've really deconstructed nice. and deconverted and then want to reach out to me to talk about it. Yeah, they're happy to share that with you because they know you'll be able to understand on yeah. on some level. Yeah. Um, was there uh, 
any particular resource, I mean, that's going back a few years for when you um, deconverted and deconstructed, was there a specific book or video series or talking to someone that uh, was really helpful for you? Or do you have resources to recommend? Well, yeah, I, it's weird. I was deconverting right around the whole new atheist thing. And I don't even know if I buy what a new atheist is. It's just atheism. It's just that there was a surge, you know, that the God delusion had just come out and mm -hmm. Sam Harris is the end of faith and Daniel Dennett and, and Hitch was touring with his book, God is not great. I think that book released in 2008. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was, you know, it was, there was this height of uh, buzz about atheism with these high profile people. But in my own life, I stumbled upon a debate video. It was Christopher Hitchens versus a rabbi in New York. I'm not Jewish, but I figured the rabbi would have a pretty good beat on the Bible against mm -hmm. an atheist. <laughs> and so I just happened to watch the video while I was doing some other work. And it's weird how one little thing, one click of a YouTube video can alter the trajectory of your whole life. It's weird. But it happened because at the end of that 90 minutes, the guy I was supposed to disagree with, the atheist guy, was the one who made the most sense. It's weird. The guy I was supposed to oppose made the most sense. Hmm. And I remember when it was over, I was like, okay. Now, again, I'm in a position of safety. No one's watching. No one's judging. I'm just, I'm able to do this on my own. So I start to click other debates. And then I find, I didn't know who Richard Dawkins was at the time. Oh, I'm dog sitting. I've got animals sitting. Hang on. I've got my two dogs and then a grand dog. I've got my, uh, my stepdaughter's a golden doodle who is a big... <laughs> big lap dog. Um, anyway, forgive the uh, the animals. It may happen again. That's okay. But uh, Richard Dawkins, I'd never heard of him. So I discovered him because he was mentioned by Christopher Hitchens. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hitchens had mentioned a former pastor in Canada, uh, Charles Templeton, who had oh. been like their Billy Graham, and he had mm -hmm. deconverted and mm -hmm. written a book called Farewell to God. And so I bought that book. And then through him, I found out about Dan Barker, former pastor of 20 years who deconverted. Right. Well, I wanted yes. to hear his story. So I bought yes. Godless and I read The God Delusion. And, and I was almost like the person who had been out in the desert and finding the oasis. And people said I was obsessed. You're obsessed. This is all you're doing. You are reading nonstop. You are watching videos nonstop. You are having conversations nonstop. It's just 24-7. Uh, What's the story? And they're correct. I was obsessed. I, I felt like I had, I, I had been holding my breath for decades. Yes. And here is sweet oxygen. Yes. And I, I was playing catch up. I was discovering as much of the world as I could. And I... And I started to finally get some answers to questions that none of the theologians and apologists had. And so, you know, it's funny, my whole world began to really open up. And, and uh, there are so many people who were part of that machine. But on the thinkingatheist.com website, I do have a resources page. It's wildly inadequate. There's no way you can... <laughs> I just... I just found some. There's like a podcast resource page, and there are different books from science books, to understanding evolution, to deconstructing Christianity, to understanding cults. I tried to give a potpourri. There's a pod, uh, podcast and YouTube pages link in there. It's Excellent. Again, it's far from complete, but it's it's a good starting point. Yes. Because a lot of people who stumble upon my work, they're the ones who type atheist into a Google search. Right. Because they're starting to do what I was doing 15 years ago. They're yeah. really getting serious about yeah. it. Yeah. So it's just, you know, if you want to go to the thinkingatheist.com, you'll see a, a links or a resources tab, and maybe that's a good starting block for you. And and uh, online, you'll find a lot of good stuff with a good search on Google as well. Excellent. Yes. And I know that um, you and I, because of the work that I've done uh, with the Conference on Religious Trauma, so you and I, I think, have overlap in quite a few of the people that we know uh, in the atheist community and the religious trauma recovery um, community. And certainly Dr. Marlene 
Winnell and yeah. Dr. Daryl Ray uh, and Dan also, Dan Barker has spoken at my events as well. And I think you and I also have a friend uh, in common in Alice Gretchen, who's an actress and an author. And her mm-hmm. website, Dare to Doubt, has a fantastic list of resources for people coming out of many different religious backgrounds. Um, so I'm quite happy to give a, a shout out to those folks too. Uh, and this pretty much brings us to the end to this um, portion of the podcast. We only have a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask you some bonus questions. We're almost done. Are you okay? Just yeah, for a you're couple. Fine. I'll okay. try to keep them brief for you so you can get more in. Go ahead. All right. I'm sure all of your uh, listeners and watchers and readers are dying to know what your favorite cheese is. Swiss with Sweet. cheddar a close second. Yes. The holy cheese. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Uh, favorite musical genre? Uh, probably 80s music simply because it was the soundtrack of my youth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, same here. Um, have you watched anything recently that you think the rest of us should watch? I am currently more than halfway through a Hulu true crime docudrama series called Under the Banner of Heaven about a murder that happened in a fundamentalist Mormon culture. Yes. And it is uh, it is fantastic. And I just finished the series finale of Better Call Saul. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul are my two yes. favorite television shows yes. of all time, bar none. They are fantastic. Oh, both of those series were yeah. just amazing. Um, and the last question, is there anything that is giving you hope these days? Well, I think I'm like a lot of people, when you log on to the world in the morning, you do find yourself discouraged because there is an abundance of awful out there. What does give me some hope and optimism is that I am seeing the rise of the religious nuns, the non-religious, not atheists, not necessarily, although they're part of that, but Mm -hmm. people who just, they're not engaged, they don't care, they don't need it. You know, I don't know what they call themselves, but they don't attend church. They're not aligned with a dogma. They don't want to judge people. They just want to live and be happy and do their thing. And and that means that the religious power players, the fundamentalists, the Christian nationalists, the theocrats, the people who have held the reins of power for so long, you know, they're doing it. This is what Andrew Seidel, the constitutional attorney, calls them wailing against the dying of their privilege. Mm. One of the reasons I think they're so dangerous now is because they realize that they are facing irrelevance, cultural, mm-hmm. statistical irrelevance. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I think, I don't know how much I'll see of it in my lifetime, but this is becoming more and more of a non-religious United States of America. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be frustrating. And it's, you know, I, there we have a lot of mountains to climb. But I just think that cat's out of the bag. Yeah, I just think people and more and more are, they're divorcing religion. They just yes. don't want it. They don't need it to have a good life. And I have, uh, I've taken that as a real point of hope. That's sort of my, my North Star. Like I just keep walking toward that. One day we will be a, a more of a secular nation in practice, just like the constitution says. And that does give me some optimism and helps me get up in the mornings as well. Oh, that's so encouraging. That's such a wonderful note to end on. Seth Andrews, thank you for being my very first guest on the Divorcing Religion podcast. Oh, you're amazing. It's been a real (laughs) honor. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Tune in again soon. Take care. 